Greetings and welcome to another edition of The Pedal Shift Project. The Pedal Shift Project is a series of conversations, thoughts, and experiments around the bike touring lifestyle. From tips and tricks to ideas on how to ride your ride, let's shrink the world by bike. Show notes and more are available at pedalshift.net slash 270, and you can email the show at pedalshift at pedalshift.net or text me at 202-930-1109 and check Pedal Shift out on all the socials as well. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 270th edition of the Pedal Shift Project. My name is Tim Mooney. Thank you so much for joining. On this edition, we are in the teeth of winter here in the northeastern United States, so we are talking all about winter fitness and bike maintenance. It is that time of year. Um, For the last couple of winters in the D.C. area, it's been very chill, like almost no snow at all. This month, we have had more snow than I think the last two winters combined and maybe throw in another one too. So it's been a lot more wintry, a lot less bike focused, at least uh, on the (laughs) outdoor side of things. So one of the things that was part of last week's episode, which is talking about my fitness, I wanted to talk about ways for you to maintain your fitness or achieve fitness during these tough winter months. Now, for those of you who are south of the equator and you're enjoying your summers, I hope you're having fun and getting out there and riding your ride and all of that other stuff. For the rest of us, well, it's winter and it's time to kind of figure out what to do. I also wanted to talk a little bit about bike maintenance in the second half of our discussion today because I think that winter is an excellent time to really, really break apart that bike and and do what you can do within your skill level. So we'll talk a little bit about the kinds of things that I do as somebody who's moderately handy, but maybe not like bike mechanic kind of handy level. Um, So that might be helpful for you. As you're staring at your bike with uh, a foot of snow outside, like so many of us are. Um, So let's start off with the winter fitness situation. Um, As I mentioned, I am looking at trying to lose some weight that I gained at the end of 2021 and try to get myself in shape ahead of my next tour, which is happening in eh, a month and change or so, um, six weeks, eight weeks, something along those lines. So, you know, as I mentioned As part of the goals episode, my current fitness starting point was not really great. Um, And that might be overstating how good it was. Let's be honest. Um, the, The things that I have done in the past are, I think, the things that I'm going to do to try to dig myself out of this hole. I have found that they've worked uh pretty well for me, but I'm also going to be making some changes just to kind of help out with the fitness element of things rather than just focus on weight loss. As important as I think weight loss will be for me, um, I would really like to get into better biking shape. And so I've got a couple of things on here. Let's start off with the things that I've done before that have worked for me, especially from the concept of weight loss. The first is intermittent fasting. Um, Let me also start off by saying how you eat, how you uh, attack your fitness, how you handle weight loss. This is all really personal. It's really important that you do you. Uh, This won't work for everybody. Um, For many of you, you may want to consult with your doctor ahead of time uh, just because some for some some of this stuff can actually be dangerous if you do it wrong. Um, I happen to have done a lot of um, work on this. I have talked to my doctor for some of these things as well. So just wanted to throw that out there ahead of time, you know, lawyer. Right. Um, (laughs) But also because reality. Right. You know, everybody's got their own thing going on. So intermittent fasting. There's a lot of interesting data out there. I'm not going to kind of go through all of it here on this podcast. Definitely go out and you know research it if this is of interest to you. But I, there, there's a lot of really interesting data about how healthy intermittent fasting can be for you. Not only is it a, a potential way to reduce the amount of calories that you take into in, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, but there's some interesting data about how our the, the, the use of our digestive system is an interesting indicator of our lifespan. The more you use your digestive system, and I'm really yada yadaing this, so forgive me on that. The, the more you use your digestive system, the lower your lifespan is. The less you use it, the higher. Now, do I believe that as a one-to-one thing or that it's more of a correlation? I'm not sure, but it's really interesting data. I also know how I tend to feel when I do intermittent fasting. 
And that is, I don't feel hungry in my fasting periods, and I feel better overall energy-wise. So this works for me. Um, I used to do a noon to eight feed window. Um, and, by, and by the way, if you're brand new to all of this, let me let me back up a little bit. Intermittent fasting is basically a fancy way of saying you push your feeding time into specific windows. They tend to be more restrictive than your fasting window. What I've been doing is noon to eight for a long time until my <laughs> lengthy break at the end of last year, most of last year, <laughs> which is part of my problem. Um, I found that noon to eight was a very good place for me to be in for long-term success. I have since found that I can narrow that even more. Um, I don't do it every day. I do at least a noon to eight for sure during uh, all the time. But I've also compressed it for other times where I essentially eat one large meal a day. And that has worked really well for me um, in terms of energy, in terms of, of everything um, that I use as a way of just determining how I'm feeling and how I'm looking. Um, the, the reason why intermittent fasting can be really good when paired with the next thing, which is calorie uh, tracking and calorie restriction, is that you can only eat so much food in one sitting. And um, if, if it does work for you, then it's really, really easy to have a big glorious meal and still be doing a, a pretty substantial calorie restriction. Again, this is the kind of thing that you've got to, it's very tailored to what your needs are and how you feel and what your medical situation is. So I, again, really want to make sure that folks understand that this is not exactly what I'd call a dieting podcast or a fitness podcast by any stretch of the imagination. But since this is where I'm at, I thought I would share these things. I use a calorie tracking app called Lose It, which I've uh, had some good experience with. Um, I use the paid version just because it tracks a variety of things, but the free version actually works quite well. It's really good for tracking calories for foods when you don't have a label to refer to. Um, is it going to be perfect every time? No, but if you can come within a certain percentage of what the actual calories that you've got, that can be really, really helpful. It's also really good to kind of you know, some people use uh, food diaries and things like that. I just kind of go by how I feel. You know, I had a, I, I, you know, I find when I do this, I realize I feel much better about what I eat and how I go about my days when I'm like, you know what, I'm feeling really satiated by the food that I ate. And it was mostly vegetables and, 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 and then on other days when maybe I do something that's a little more calorically dense, I tried KFC just has this new plant-based chicken. I was like, okay, I'll try that out. And it was fine, but it was calorically really dense, and I didn't feel as good because there weren't any real vegetables in it, despite it being plant-based, you know? So, you know, you start to realize the trade-offs that you have with food. And that's really important for somebody like me who's always had a weird relationship with food and how I go about it, using it as fuel for just everyday life, not to mention bicycle touring. So between intermittent fasting and calorie restriction, smart calorie restriction, you know, I can find myself losing anywhere between two and maybe four pounds if it's really aggressive, especially in the early days. I tend to lose weight early, or quicker earlier. Um, I can lose more than a couple of pounds in a, a given week. But it's a pretty consistent two to three pounds a week, which is a really good healthy way to do it. Now, the one thing that I'll say that I've done in the past when I've been in this this headspace, especially during winters, because it's almost always during winters when I do this, is because the type of fitness stuff that I do is not as easily available during the winters, I don't do much more than walks typically. This year, I'm going to mix it up a little bit, though. Um, I, as I mentioned on the last show, I pulled out my trainer. I've hooked up the Goblin to that. And I've been doing some indoor cycling for the first time in a really, really long time. Well, let me be the first to say, I do bike touring because I strongly prefer outdoor cycling <laughs> by a lot. But when the weather's like this, I really don't have that as an option, um, especially when it's icy out like it's been here over the last few weeks. It's just it's just not my favorite thing to do. Can you do it? Sure. Uh, I know I have a lot of listeners who cycle full, full year and especially during winter conditions, but I tend not to like it once it gets below a certain uh, temperature. And I also don't like bicycling on ice very much. So indoor cycling. The one thing that's really interesting is I've started using Apple Fitness. Now, this is not an ad for Apple Fitness. Or I'm certainly not sponsored by them, but um, it, it fits into the ecosystem of tech that I use. I have an Apple Watch. 
uh, iPhone, you know, the whole the whole nine yards. And I was expecting I got, you know, got the free trial and I was expecting to kind of hate it. You know, I'm not a big trainer person. Um, it doesn't tend to motivate me a lot when somebody's like, oh, go do it. You're awesome. It's just not my vibe. Um, but actually, I've been kind of enjoying the few times that I've done it. So I'm probably going to stick with it. Um, I'm also finding that when you do the indoor cycling routines that they use, it's really built for things uh, for exercise bikes when you can kind of increase and decrease the tension a little bit easier. I can upshift and downshift uh, using the trainer that I have, but it's not quite the same, I think, as the kind of traditional exercise bikes. I briefly thought about buying an exercise bike and then thought, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to stick with this. So I've been kind of working my way along with these training routines. I think what I find the trainers to do to be better at is long time in the saddle, just pedaling away. But you quickly realize when you do indoor cycling, and for those of you who've been doing this for a long time, you know you're about to say, yeah, duh, (laughs) you know, you're constantly spinning under constant resistance. And frankly, that's not the kind of cycling that I do very often when I'm touring. It's a lot of pedal, 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 coast, pedal, 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 coast, which is why we can do it for so long, especially on flats. So um, it's a very different type of cycling, but I think get back to the fitness element of all of this. I think that the muscle that it builds, the the training that it brings to me uh, will will really, really benefit me uh, for any touring in the late winter and early spring because I think I'll be in much better bicycling shape, um, certainly from a cardio perspective. I mean, I can't even tell you how much better my cardio has gotten. Um, and it's nice to have that feedback data from the watch and things like that. So I would say, you know, so far so good with all of this. I know it's not everybody's bag. I am not the type of person who likes to quote unquote train for bicycle touring, but I'm going to give it a shot and just see how it feels. I know that that combined with my weight loss, it's going to be a much better thing for, for my winter fitness going into the Florida tour coming on. I may consider adding on some upper body work using high intensity, um, uh, interval training that's also available through Apple Fitness, or just adding on some other things as well. I, I've noticed that through the years that my upper body strength is just terrible because I don't do anything with it other than chopping wood, <laughs> which is great and all, but probably not a consistent way to maintain fitness up there. Um, you know, I'm getting into the age where they say that you know you're it's going it's harder and harder to maintain muscle tone and all that other kind of stuff. So I'm just mindful of all of that. I'd like to stay fit enough to do bicycle touring for the next 20 years, maybe more if I can. Um, And I think it's important to pay attention now and to do the work now to help pay dividends off later. It's sort of like, you know, saving for retirement, right? It's you got to got to put in the work now. So some other things that I'm looking at doing, I'm going to hike with Mookie a little bit more. I don't know if you can hear him snoring below me here, (laughs) probably, (laughs) because that's just how it goes. Um, I really like getting out there with him, especially when we're at the cabin. We're going to be at the cabin uh, for a couple of months during winter because we're getting some renovations done at the place in D.C. So I have some really good opportunities to do that. It doesn't have to be long hikes. You know, going up the mountain and coming back down uh, is literally less than 15 minutes, but it's a really good cardio workout. And I think that that can be really helpful as a cross train. Of course, I talked about this uh, before. I'm doing a winter tour in Florida. It's not happening at the end of January. Uh, in fact, it would have been what, a week from today week from today, I would have been thinking about it, I think, uh, if I had stuck with plan. Boy, I'm glad I moved it for all sorts of good reasons. Um, but, you know, I think that this gives me some more time to get into better shape, uh, gives me another full month, which I think is really good. Um, my goal for all of this, and we talked about goals last week, but let me reiterate it here. My goal is to return to my pre-pandemic weight by the time my spring tour comes about. Um, and, and the spring tour is to be determined, uh, to be announced. Uh, we're going to be spending the next several weeks talking about some a variety of different touring options as part of the scouting series that I'm going to be doing throughout January and February. So we'll talk more about the where in a moment in, in the next few weeks. But what I'd really like to do is to be able to, by that time, be in a place where, A, my weight is down to where it was pre-pandemic. 
which is very much within reach, at least according to the tracking that I've got right now. And two, I want to have really vastly improved cardio and muscle tone. Um, and I think that if I stick with the, the extra things that I'm adding on here, the, the, the cycling, indoor cycling, doing the hiking and all those other things, I think that this is all very attainable and it just, you know, got to put in some work. You know, I'm uh, doing a dry January and a mostly dry February. Uh, Buffalo Bills willing, you know, if they go to the Super Bowl, I have made an exception for that. So, you know, they have some work to do. So do I to be able to have some beer on Super Bowl Sunday, but we shall see. <laughs> they had a very big win uh, uh, the other day as I'm sitting here and they have a very tough game coming up. So sports ball. Anyways, that's what I've got to say about winter fitness because um, I, it's 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 a project. It's a big project. And I'm really excited to share the how things are going to be going. I'll probably be checking in with you occasionally just to let you know how things are going, particularly as we get close to the winter tour in a few weeks. And uh, at, maybe by the time I do the preview episode, I'll have some good things to say about that because I, I'm looking at that as an opportunity to uh, uh, hit some kind of a goal that is an intermediate goal to the pre-pandemic weight goal. And I, I, I'm well on the way to that, so I'm pretty excited about that. I wish there were better ways to uh, measure the cardio and the muscle tone. I suppose that there are uh, ways to do that with uh, some of the things that the scale tells me beyond just the weight. So maybe I'll have some good info on that too. So that's winter fitness. Much more to come on that. Okay, next up is more about winter work but not on me, on the bike. Um, my bike situation, as you all know, is sort of spread amongst three separate vehicles. You know, I've got the um, the main touring bike, which has seen precious little work over the last year. Uh, the Green Goblin, which got a lot more work than I had originally thought. And then, of course, the Brompton as well. The bike maintenance status on all of them is not super ideal. Normally, I like to do some kind of uh, overhaul is maybe not the wrong word, but I'd like to at least know what I'm getting into by the end of the season before the holidays. And sometimes I do a lot of work on the bikes over the holidays just because I have some extra time. This year, no. <laughs> so it's not an ideal situation. I've not really spent a lot of time on them. Let me start off by talking about the main touring bike, the Safari. I, I think that it's in pretty good shape considering because I didn't put it through a really nasty, big, long uh, bike beating tour this year. It's been on the CNO. I, I did some riding on it. I did do at least one tour this year, but it was earlier in the year. The one thing that it really needs um, some help with, and this is just baffling to me, is the rear brakes. Now I've got, I don't have um, uh, uh, I have rim brakes, I should say, on all of the bikes. Uh, just that's what I've got. And the rear brakes on that safari have been disengaged for months because they are so tight, I cannot get them re-engaged. Now, it's because I am lazy and impatient and have just, anytime I've ridden it, I've just been, front brakes are fine. Front brakes are fine because literally it's only been for like short distances. I haven't been going very far and it's been fine. I know, I know, I know, I know. You're not supposed to do that. You should have all your brakes don't don't do what I do. Um, so I got to figure that out. And I think that it's been so bad. I, I've tried really, really hard to squeeze them together to get that reengaged and can't do it. So I think I may end up just like completely disengaging um, the cable from it and redoing it from scratch, which I probably should have done months ago. Uh, but I'm just going to do it. And I think that um, I'll give it a good once over. I think that it probably could stand a good cleaning, um, but I'd have to do it on a day, I think, when I would have a better chance of having it dry out, uh, i.e. not when it's below freezing outside. So I'm going to give that a, a good look at some point. It may end up coming with me to the cabin when we're out there for the couple of months while the renovations happen so that I can just do some good work on it. Um, and, and maybe even, you know, I think on the porch often it'll stay above freezing even when it's a little bit below freezing um, outside. So I may give that a shot. But for the most part, that bike is in relatively good shape. And that would be the bike that probably wouldn't get a job to do until the spring tour coming up. So I've got some time to go on that. Um, the Goblin, the Green Goblin, which is the vintage Novara Safari, same brand, but just like a much older version. 
I believe from the late 1990s, if memory serves. I, I've got a, I've got links in the past episodes where I had more of the details there. Uh, that one needs some more attention. Now, of course, uh, if you were with the show at all last year, of course, you know about the chain. The chain, the drivetrain, I'll tell you what, man, that thing is really doing well right now. Um, I'm, I'm legit surprised how well it shifts now, even though all I did was replace the chain and didn't do anything to touch the rest of the drivetrain. It didn't touch the any of um, uh, the, the, the main sprockets or anything along those lines. It, it, just shocking to me how well it is working, um, which I think, as I mentioned in other shows, has a lot to do with uh, the bike mechanic in Portland who did some great work on it to get it into the shape that it's in right now. The problem with it, though, is I think that it needs some much more substantial work done with the braking cables. Um, I think that it is also probably beyond my ability to fix. Um, I may try and do a little bit of like Googling to see if I can fix this. But what I've got is a pretty common problem um, that I've had in the past where the brake cable housing becomes detached from where the braking mechanism is up on the handlebars. And so when I squeeze on it, it it, it shifts. So I don't get really good uh, tight connections with the between the cable and the brakes. And so it's spongy. And I think I used that exact term the last time I wrote it. Um, if I can fix that myself, I would love to. But for the most part, when it gets into cabling level stuff, I don't have the tools nor the know-how um, to address that. So I tend to bring it into bike shops for stuff like that. This is a good time of year to go to a bike shop because they tend to need the business. Um, and and I think that I, that might be something that I do. Now, question though, right? Eh, I thought that the goblin was retired. Well, as you all know, I don't think that it's going to be in full retirement mode. So I think that I would like to make the investment in the goblin just to make sure that it is rideable to the extent that I do want to ride it again the way that I have this past fall. So I'm probably going to get it to a shop, maybe even the uh, folks down at CNO Bicycles in Hancock. They've done decent jobs on the bikes before, um, especially for something like brake cables. That I think that whomever they have working there will probably do a good job. Um, I have a preferred bike shop here in D.C. that I bring for other um, things, but they've been just slammed all throughout COVID. So I'll have to give them a call and see what's going on with them because uh, it might be worth bringing it back out here to DC to get looked at because I just like those mechanics. They they've done a more consistently good job on my bikes before. So, um, yeah, that's the goblin. And last but not least, what about the Brompton? Cause the Brompton's the one where I've got a plan. I am within, uh, like I said, probably six weeks or so of my next tour and it's going to be with the Brompton and it is running really, really, really well. <laughs> it does not get nearly the mileage that the other bikes get. It's more of a city bike when um, it's not touring, but it has been doing really, really well. I have had one consistent frustration with it. The replacement easy wheels that I got on it when I first got it, I love them a lot. I, I really like that they, they have a, a rubber gasket O-ring almost, which serves as the, for lack of a better word, the tire on it. And if you don't know anything about Bromptons, when they're in folded mode, they have these very small, uh, I would say they're maybe like two inch wide tires. And two, when I say wide, I mean diameter. Um, and they're very, very thin. And that's how the bike rolls when it's in folded mode. And it they take a ton of pressure and damage and all this other stuff. Well, I've taken this bike in a variety of places and those O-rings slip off very easily, especially on uneven surfaces, cobblestones, brick, things like that. And that's where the Brompton has gone a lot. It's been in some really wonderful places like Paris and, you know, DC and lots of great cities. And it really wrecked two of the wheels uh, such that they, they weren't holding on those O-rings very much at all. And it was a real problem. So the one challenge with them is that they are the types of uh, wheels that were changed uh, about maybe four years ago when Brompton did a design change. Now, all of the tires are, or, excuse me, these easy wheels are all, I got to get this right, six millimeter require six millimeter screws. Um, however, this Brompton has some that are five millimeter, and this was really becoming problematic for me because I was 
I could never remember which ones were the fives, which ones were the sixes. Did I want to do something like put on uh, uh, inline skating wheels? I might have even mentioned that on the show before as replacements. Well, I went back and forth on it, and as the time was getting closer and closer around the holidays, I was like, okay, i got to figure this out. And as it turns out, the wheels that needed to be replaced are the 6 millimeter variety, which are much easier to attain because that's what all Brompton Easy Wheels are now. So I was able to get a relatively inexpensive replacements. They came in the mail, or yeah, that one they came in the mail, not the U.S. mail. Anyways, that's more detail than necessary. I got them delivered to me and I was able to easily put them on and everything is great. It rolls like a dream again. And I'm really, really excited about that. I need to give this a really good cleaning and then make sure that that chain is, you know, properly lubed up. Of course, it's, you know, a, a internal hub system. So it's not like that the chain is shifting to other gears in a, in, in a way that uh, it needs to move. But it's, of course, always better for it to be in good health and all of that. But I don't think that this bike needs to hit a bike shop at all. At all. Uh, shifts really well, brakes really well. The last time I took it in, to the uh, uh, very good Brompton mechanic here in D.C. He did a great job on it, and it's doing pretty well. So I'm I'm excited about just doing some very minor work on this bike and then having it be ready to tackle Central Florida, which, of course, we'll, we'll be doing the preview episode in a few weeks for all of that. Generally speaking, though, across all three bikes, thorough cleanings to the extent that I can pull that off, chain care as i mentioned with the brompton all of them could probably use a little bit of that that cno and the gap they throw grit on those chains every single time so i want to make sure that they're really cleaned up and then you know some other assessments i think as necessary you know i've looked at potentially changing the racks on um uh, the main safari. I've looked at doing the same on the Goblin, potentially uh, the drivetrain, you know, always worth it, giving them a look. But I think for the most part, I'm not looking at any major overhauls for any of these bikes, at least based on what I've seen so far. And I think that that's excellent. So I would say, although I started this all off by saying that my bike maintenance status was not super ideal, I think it's Nothing that some good TLC, some good cleaning, some good looping uh, can can help get me to a better place with all of that. And I'll end up having uh, a variety of bikes for a variety of different types of trail surfaces. Uh, and I'll be ready to hit the spring really running. Well, really the winter running um, because I, I'm, I can't tell you how excited I am to go down to Florida for this ride. Um, it's... Um, I, I, it's part of the goals to go back to the first segment about fitness. It's sort of like the reward for having better fitness, that intermediate uh, place where I'll feel better, I'll bike better. And I think that it will turn out to uh, be a much higher quality tour because I've got some more time to get to that intermediate stage where it's like, okay, yeah, you're, you're in a better place. Uh, the bike's running well, you're riding well, it's not hurting, <laughs> you know, all the good things that make a good bike tour. So, uh, but the bikes themselves from a maintenance perspective, not ideal, but very, very fixable. And that's, what's really exciting. As I mentioned, for the next several weeks with the little bit of an interregnum with a best of the second part of the D.C. to Cincinnati tour, we're going to be talking about some route scouting. And I'm calling this a remote route scouting series. We're going to be doing three separate episodes where I am going to be talking about potential rides for the spring. On next week's episode, I am going to talk about a route that is brand new to me that I have eyed for a very long time and I'm really kind of intrigued with. Is it going to be the tour for the spring? Well, let's take a look at it. Next week on the Pedal Shift Project, remote route scouting the Texas Hill Country Loop. And as always, we like to close out the show with a special shout out to the Pedal Shift Society. Because of support from listeners like you, Pedal Shift is a weekly bicycle touring podcast with a global community, expanding into live shows and covering new tours like this fall's upcoming bike tour. If you like what you hear, you can support the show for five bucks, two bucks, or even a buck a month. And there's one shot and annual options. If you're not into the small monthly thing, check it all out at pedalshift.net slash society onto the society. Kimberly Wilson, Caleb Jenkinson, Cameron Lean, Andrew McGregor, Michael Hart, Keith Nagel, Brock Dittis, Thomas Skadow, Marco Lowe, Terrence Manson, Harry Telgatis, Chris Barron, Mark Van Rank, Brad Hipwell, 
Mr. T, Nathan Poulton, Stephen Dickerson, Vince LaGreco, Cody Florchinger, Tom Beninati, Greg Braithwaite, Sandy Pizio, Jeff Muster, Seth Pollock, Joseph Quinn, Drew Porter, Byron Patterson, Joaquin Robber, Ray Jackson, Jeff Fry, Kenny Mikey, Lisa Hart, John Denkler, Steve Hankel, Miguel Quinones, Alejandro Aviles Reyes, Keith Spangler, Greg Towner, Jody Zoranin, Lucas Barwick, Michael Baker, Brian Bechtal, Reinhardt Bigel, Greg Middlemas, Connie Moore, William Gothman, Brian Benton, Joan Churchill, Mike Bender, Rick Weinberg, Billy Crafton, Gary Matushak, Greg Latois Lopez, James Sloan, Jonathan Dillard, John Funk, Ronald Paroli, Dave Roll, Brian Hafner, Misha LeBon, Ari Messenger, David Gropke, Todd Grosbeck, Wally Estrella, Sue Reinert, John Lico, Stephen Granada, Philip Mueller, Robert Lackey, Dominic Carroll, Jackie McCullough, John Hickman, Carl Presso, David Neves, Patty Louise, Terry Fitzgerald, Peter Steinmetz, Timothy Fitzpatrick, Michael Azuski, Hank O'Donnell, David Zanoni, David Wilde, Matthew Sponsor, Chad Reno, Spartan Dale, Carolyn Ferguson, Peggy Littlefield, Lauren Allen Smith, Eric Burns, Thomas Pearl, Darren McKibben, Richard Stewart, Dave Fletcher, Jack Smith, Luke Parkinson, and new to the society, Ryan Patterson. And thanks also to all past and anonymous folks for helping make this show happen. Thank you for joining. You can find Pedal Shift at pedalshift.net for more great bicycle touring content. You can hear the Pedal Shift project through Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. Opening music courtesy of Jason Kent off his self-titled album. The track is called America. Check out his band Sunfield's latest release, Mono Mono, wherever cool music is available.